Pwede na yun. I was just waiting five more minutes for more people to turn up. How are we? Ex how many are we expecting, Devina? Fifty-eight. Should we wait five minutes? I can't hear you. Oh, sorry, we can wait five minutes.
Good evening, all. I'm not sure whether you can hear me because my uh, internet is playing up today. I'm going to start with Omka and then hand over to Devina and Caroline, who will um, talk about low care and guide us. We think. So, going to mute everyone because basically we want you to write all your questions on the chat group where Daksha and uh, Devina can concentrate in uh, writing them down and ask, asking those questions to Caroline. I think I've been cut off again. No, I can hear you. No? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Oh. Women to women and I welcome you all. Um, I want to make sure this is a successful low carb weight loss program. We have six sessions. I've already given you the dates and uh, we're going to proceed further than those six sessions we've had. And we're going to succeed in whatever we do. We've got the experts who's going to guide us and we're going to make sure we're going to do it what they tell us. It's a positive mind to have it and to do it. Um, I've got Davina, I've got Caroline, and I've got uh, Daksha, who are our mentors. So we're going to listen to them and they're going to guide us all the way. Wow. We're also going to line up um seminars on b12 vitamin c and vitamin d i've already set those dates up with the speakers so keep your space for that as well so as i said any questions just put it in the chat group so this way we don't even mess around wasting our time by uh, people jumping in and out questioning us this way we will save time. Can I invite Devina, please? Yeah, Car Caroline's actually going to do the presentation. Oh. Uh, myself and um, Baksha will introduce ourselves. And Caroline's going to start it. Over to you, Caroline. Yeah, okay. I I'll show my screen now if that's all right. Yeah. Here we go. To slideshow. Okay, hopefully you can all see that and you can hear me all right? Yeah. Yep, great. Uh, well, um, namaste. Um, thank you very much for inviting us to run this um, course for you. And I like the positive vibes I'm getting already. So that's really good. Um, and um, as you've already said, uh, it's not just me. I'm, I'm going to introduce myself in a second, but I've also got with me um, two other 
um, ambassadors for the Public Health Collaboration. So my name's Carolyn and I'm a retired nurse, um, but I'm here today to speak to you really as an ambassador for PHC rather than um, from a professional point of view. Um, I got involved with the Public Health Collaboration some years ago when they were just starting um, because I myself have found through my own personal um, weight loss issues that I've had pretty much all of my adult life or certainly since I had children um, and I discovered that all the kind of typical ways that we're encouraged to to lose weight just didn't work and along my journey of learning what does work I learned so much more about nutrition that I wish I'd known 20 30 years ago I certainly wish I'd known it when I was bringing my children up um, so it's not anything I've learned by virtue of being a nurse it's what I've learned through self-education and I was delighted to discover the group Public Health Collaboration because they are a group of like-minded healthcare professionals and ordinary individuals who have all come to the conclusion that the general guidelines we're getting um, from government are not as satisfactory and they're not helping us to lose weight or indeed to manage type 2 diabetes, which has become um, a huge, huge problem throughout most of the world, to be honest. The World Health Organization is worried about it globally, but it's certainly a massive problem in um, Western societies such as our part of Europe and the USA. So um, I'm here to talk to you, as I say, as a representative of an organisation that's trying really hard to get good education out to the general public, as well as to lobby um, in, at Parliament to get the guidelines changed. But that's enough from me. I want to introduce my colleague Dacha to you briefly, just to say a few words about herself. So it's Dacha unmuted. I think she was having some internet problems. Okay, well, maybe she can introduce herself later. Uh, do you want to say a few words, Davina, and then we'll crack on? Yeah, I I'm also um, part of the Public Health Collaboration for Watford and Stockport. Um, and I, I went in. Um, Davina, can you be louder, please? I know, I You're not loud enough. Speaker. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, sorry, yeah. So I, I got into a um, healthy lifestyle to help my migraines. Um, and since, since then, uh, um, you know, since adopting a healthier lifestyle with fasting and um, sort of looking at how many carbohydrates I eat, the migraines have actually improved as well as my blood markers. Sorry, my screen's actually, um, you know, quite close to the screen right now. I, I can't get the mic working on my computer. So yeah, so I'll, I'll hand you back to Carolyn. Okay, is that she's still struggling? Um, let me unmute her. I don't know if, um, she's there, but I don't know. Okay. Yeah, okay. Well, at the end, we, we, we hopefully we can get Dacia to say a few words because she's also come to public health collaboration through her own struggles with health issues uh, and um, found... Dacia can, Dacia can jump in now. Right, are you there now? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Namaste, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm Luxa and um, like Carolyn, I'm a public health collaboration ambassador. Um, I... My journey is also, um, well, started when I became sick. I thought I was eating a healthy diet. I was following the guidelines, you know, eating home-cooked food, but also some, you know, processed food. But, you know, I was thinking maybe a jacket potato and baked beans and um, those kind of things were healthy um, until I became really, really ill with um, an autoimmune condition, which affected my thyroid, um, had all kinds of horrendous symptoms so when I when I discovered that some of these issues had been caused because I was eating um, the wrong types of foods the foods that didn't suit me although you know like um, um, for me I, I you know I was eating a traditional diet as well as like Um, yeah, C can everyone hear me? I, I was temporarily muted again. Um, so yeah, so I was eating, you know, like uh, our traditional dishes, like um, 
dal, rice, um, you know, potato curry, chapatis. And I just feel that um, without realizing all of those foods were converting in my body to, to glucose. Anyway, to cut a long story short, um, I was feeling sleepy. I was falling asleep behind the driving steering wheel of a car, which is really dangerous. Um, anyway, I, I, it's, a, it's a long story, but basically I'm so glad I discovered real food and um, able to um, reverse a lot of my issues. Yeah, so I'm hoping we can help you guys too. Thanks very much. Um, so we're all here um, very much enthusiasts of eating the way we believe that man is supposed to eat uh, the human animal as opposed to the way that manufacturers uh, and various other people have convinced us in the last few decades that we should eat. Mm -hmm. um, we'll get back to all of that. I just want to say that we are all here um, as ambassadors for public health collaboration, not as medical professionals. Um, we're not here to give you medical advice. If you are currently diabetic or taking other medications, perhaps for high blood pressure, um, then we really would like you to let your GPs know that you're going to try low carb because hopefully if you embrace it well, it will help your conditions and it might mean that your um, medication needs to be altered, uh, lowering of doses and maybe even removing it altogether as time goes on. So we do need you to make sure that your GPs are aware that you're trying this. If, obviously, if you're just trying to lose weight, that's a different matter. Um, but if you are on medications, particularly for diabetes or blood pressure, we really want you to make sure your GP is aware. If your GP is not sure what we're talking about with low carb, uh, let us know via PANA because we have got a template letter that we can give you to explain it all to your GP. Some GPs are better than others at being up to speed with this. Um, so, oh, now my thing won't work. Ah, there we go. Right. So as we said, um, because we're a big group, we don't want you to be all talking across uh, each other with questions. Um, so we would like you to make full use of the chat box. Um, and we'd quite like you initially to put into the chat box why you're here, what are your goals? Um, and what I think something we'd all be interested in is what do you currently believe is a healthy diet? If you could be doing that now, that would be very helpful to us. Um, but we'd really like, obviously, to, to know a bit about you all. Um, I'm hoping that quite a few of you are here because you maybe have been told you've got type 2 diabetes, you may be just being told to watch what you eat, or you may already be on medication. Or maybe you've been warned by your GP that you're heading towards diabetes, you've got what we call pre-diabetes. Um, so um, either of those two um, conditions, we, we really do want to work with you and help you. Uh, but also, um, you may just be here because you want to lose weight uh, and you've tried other diets and, and they fail, usually because you get hungry and you get fed up. Um, but the other message we want to get across is that what you eat is so, so important for your general health. We forget that food is our fuel. We are just like any, any other sort of machine, if you like, if you put the wrong fuel in, the machine does not work well. Think of us like a luxury motor car. And if you put diesel into a petrol engine of a beautiful Rolls Royce, that beautiful Rolls Royce will not work anymore. Um, it might be the little Ford KA as well. It doesn't matter, it doesn't have to be the big and beautiful. But if you put the wrong fuel in, it's not going to work. And we've really got to remember that our bodies need the right material to be able to work to the best ability. So what we want to look at over the next six weeks is why we talk about low carb, what do we mean by it and, and why are carbohydrates the thing that we're focusing on. Um, so we're going to look at that today as well as what diabetes really means and also then go on in week two to look at the other important aspects of our diet, fat, uh, and then on to protein and work week three. Um, and all the while we'll be looking at meal ideas and the adverse effects of having too much of the wrong things. We will also be looking at lifestyle because it's not just about what we eat, it's about everything else we do, how much we sleep, how much exercise we get, how much stress we've got in our lives. So all of those things we're going to look at as we go through as well. Um, and then hopefully when we get to week six, you'll all have 
had a chance to to try because we're going to have two week gaps between the, the last two sessions so that we are looking at a couple of months now for you to really get this idea into your heads and get going with it and hopefully start to see some differences. So why does all of this matter? Why low carb? Well, a diet that's high in carbohydrate, especially from the processed refined foods that are so readily available to us today, leads to weight gain and or development of type 2 diabetes. Now, I'm coming back to this in a minute, but not everybody that has diabetes is fat. So it's, it's foolish to believe that you can eat what you want because you never put on weight. If you even if you don't put on weight and you're eating the wrong foods, it can still be doing you harm. Trouble is you're getting no clues uh, that it's doing you harm and it can be very advanced um, before you realize that you've got a problem. So for any of us eating a diet that's very high in carbohydrate and particularly refined carbohydrates, it's going to cause too much sugar in our bloods. When we get too much sugar in the blood, this causes inflammation and these inflammatory reactions all around the body, they reach every single organ and can start to cause us problems. Heart, cardiovascular system, the kidneys, our immune system, which of course is very, very pertinent at the moment because we know that type two diabetes and obesity are both high risk factors for the COVID-19 infection that's causing us all so much trauma at the moment. Um, so it's really important that we get on top of this. So diabetes occurs when the body is not able to regulate sugar in the blood. Insulin is a hormone that is produced by the body, by the pancreas, um, which is a little organ that sits sort of uh, underneath your stomach on the left-hand side. You've got your liver on the right-hand side. Um, and insulin is produced as a result of there being sugar in the blood. And insulin's role is to help that sugar get from the blood into all the tissues, our muscles, our organs, our brain, all the parts of the body that need the energy um, from the glucose. But we're only meant to have a very small amount of glucose at any one time. And this insulin is there to help regulate that. Problem is, if we bombard the body with sugar, it starts to get a bit resistant and the insulin is produced, but the tissues start to react less well and don't respond to the insulin. And so we get this buildup of sugar in the blood. And the original name, when I was a young student nurse, which was a very long time ago now, um, in the early 1970s, we always referred to type two diabetes as diabetes mellitus. Mellitus is a word that means sweet because the original diagnosis of diabetes was made by urine testing, tasting sweet. Don't ask me who was tasting it, but that's how they, they kind of discovered it. Um, we don't tend to refer to it as diabetes mellitus anymore. We just talk about type one, type two, which I'll come on to. But the other thing that we used to call it, and our patients particularly used to call it when I was a young nurse, was sugar diabetes, because it was recognised that sugar was the cause of it. Um, so we've forgotten this, I think, over the decades. Um, but we'll come back to that, that topic in a minute. I just want to very briefly explain to you about the three types of diabetes because it's type two that we're here to talk about. Type one is, is a, an autoimmune condition where the pancreas simply doesn't make insulin. This is something that happens, it's nobody's fault. Um, it often occurs in childhood or young uh, adolescents, young adults. And we don't fully understand why in those individuals their pancreas just completely stops making insulin. And for them, unfortunately, the only way that they can successfully get through life is by having insulin injected. So that's type one diabetes, and we're not here to talk about that today. Although what we're learning about the management of type two diabetes is also helping us to improve the quality of life of type one diabetics as well. But type two diabetes occurs, as I've said there before, when the body no longer uses the insulin correctly, it becomes resistant to that insulin. And so not only do we end up with high levels of sugar circulating in the blood, but we also have high levels of insulin because the insulin is still being produced, 
but it's not able to do its job. So the blood sugar remains high, so more insulin is produced. And insulin, as well as the glucose, are inflammatory agents. So you've now got two types of inflammatory agents circulating, which are going to cause you problems. And this type of diabetes tends to occur in older adults. But nowadays, sadly, we are starting to see it in younger adults and sometimes in children. And this is really heartbreaking. When I was a young student, I would have rarely seen a type 2 diabetic under the age of 60 and certainly never under 50. And now we are seeing children developing type 2 diabetes because of the way our diets have changed over those decades. Just for clarity, there is a third kind of diabetes, which is known as gestational diabetes. And this occurs during pregnancy when a woman, through all the stresses of pregnancy, um, ends up with a, a, a form of diabetes. Her insulin is, is no longer doing the job during that pregnancy. And it can be a concern um, and has to be monitored carefully. But often she will uh, go back to a non-diabetic stage when the baby is born. However, we do know that women who develop gestational diabetes have a higher chance in later life of becoming diabetic. So they need good advice to help them get their diet sorted out so that they uh, reduce that chance. There are people now talking about even a type 4 diabetes, uh, which is actually Alzheimer's and dementia. Uh, there's a lot of work now showing that actually all this dysregulation because of high glucose and high insulin um, could well be affecting um, our, our brains. And that could be part of the reason why we are seeing more and more Alzheimer's or dementia uh, in modern times. So that's, that's an area that a lot of work is going on at the moment. Um, and quite worrying. But again, the good news is it doesn't have to be that way. So as I said before, I just want to clarify that there are some lucky people out there who can eat what they like and don't put on weight. However, are they really lucky? Because they can get away with a rubbish diet and they don't get the outward signs that the rest of us get, but the damage can still be being done inside and they will be putting fat uh, around their organs, even though they're not having it distributed around the outside in the, in the, in, under their skin. And we call these people toffees, i.e. thin on the outside, but fat on the inside. And they can be quite advanced in diabetes before they're discovered because they don't have, say, the normal warning signs. So uh, please don't be uh, fooled into thinking that just because somebody's skinny, they, they don't necessarily, uh, or they're not at risk of diabetes. If, if their diet is bad, they are still at risk. So as I've been saying, what, what normally happens in the blood is that when the glucose levels rise, and we should only have the equivalent of about a teaspoon of sugar circulating in our blood at any one time. So that's five grams roughly. Um, so insulin comes along and insulin should help um, that, that glucose gain entry to all our different cells around the body. So the insulin acts a bit like a key opening um, the, 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 the door of the cells to let the sugar in. Um, and in type 1 diabetes, as I mentioned, there simply is no insulin being produced. So they end up getting a high blood sugar because that in, the insulin is not there to help sugar get into the cells. But in type 2 diabetes, um, we get this insulin resistance building up and that stops the sugar getting into the cells. And the reason we worry so much about this is that when you've got all this sugar circulating, it attaches itself to your red blood cells and it can get absolutely everywhere that it shouldn't be. It's not getting inside the cells where it should be, but it's on your red blood cells getting into all your organs, causing inflammation. And we've got huge numbers now of people developing diabetes, and this can affect just about every system in the body. The heart, the cardiovascular system, um, we know it's probably the leading cause of, of cardiovascular disease. Um, it can cause problems with the nerves, it can cause problems in the eyes, um, and it can cause problems in the joints. And most people have probably heard about the diabetic foot, where it, because it affects the blood vessels, the very tiny little capillaries in the feet, the feet are always working against gravity anyway. And if you've got a poor circulation in your feet, you'll very quickly start to develop problems that can go on to cause people to even lose limbs. Um, so it's a really, really important disease to keep under control. Um, um, signs and symptoms um, are often high blood sugar, which doctors may be just 
a measuring a, as part of a, a, a normal medical, or it could be because the person's gone in saying they feel fatigued, they're very thirsty, they're weeing a lot, um, and they might actually be very hungry um, because the, the body's not getting satisfied with the food they're eating because the sugar's not getting into the blood. So there's various different symptoms that people can present with. Um, and um, traditionally, this, this has been managed by people being put on a, a diet that still contains an awful lot of carbohydrate and low fat, but this doesn't make any sense as I'll go on to explain to you in a minute. Um, people are encouraged to be uh, physically active and that's not a bad thing, um, but unfortunately physical activity doesn't uh, equal out bad diet. Um, people are often put on drugs um, to help their blood sugar regulation. And if it gets very serious, they may even have to have insulin even for type two diabetes. So it really can go on to become uh, quite a, a severe disease. And traditionally people have been told when they develop type two diabetes that this is it now, they've got this for life. This is simply not true. You're always going to be prone to diabetes, but if you have a proper diet, you can not only control it, but you can often reverse it. And as long as you stick to that good diet, you will not have diabetes. Uh, and this is a real, really wonderful um, finding that, that a lot of the, the GPs that are working with low carb diets uh, approach with their diabetics have now found. And they've got many, many success stories where people have uh, completely reversed their diabetes. So, as I said, normally you should only have one teaspoon of sugar in, in our blood and we, we measure uh, the blood sugar either through just a random blood test or um, sometimes, as I say, GPs might, might be concerned and therefore they do the blood test check. And what they'll usually ask for if they are concerned is what we call the HbA1c. Um, this is a more accurate picture of how your blood sugar has been behaving in, in the last couple of months. And I mentioned that the sugar attaches itself to the red blood cells. So this is really a, a measure of how sugary your blood has been over the last couple of months. And it's this, the standard test now that all diabetics or pre-diabetics should be offered. And that's how we monitor how well you're doing. Um, so, um, Normally in the non-diabetic range would expect a, a HbA1c to be below 42 millimoles or less than 6%. Sometimes it's measured in millimoles, sometimes in percentage. Pre-diabetics are people where it's sitting between 42 and 47 and you are diagnosed as type two diabetic if your HbA1c goes above 48. We also know that people who um, are prone to or already diabetic tend to carry a lot of weight around their middle. Um, so one of the things we'd like to make sure that you are measuring, and this is a good, good thing for people who are not yet diabetic but concerned about their weight to measure, is your waist, um, because that's a very good indicator of where you're carrying your fat. Um, so we wouldn't mind if you, Weigh yourselves now. It's nice to have a start, maybe a middle and a finish weight, uh, but we don't want you to be obsessed about weighing yourself, every, certainly not every day and maybe not even every week. Every month is probably enough. If you're having success, you'll, you'll notice your clothes are looser. You'll feel better. You don't need to be jumping on the scales every day because unfortunately, we know our body weight can vary very slightly from day to day and people can get a bit obsessed about that. But we'd like you to weigh yourself so we've got a starting weight. We'd also like you to check your waist circumference. And if you've got a tape measure at home, then weigh your, uh, measure your waist. Uh, and it's sort of um, between your belly button and your widest part, you want to sort of go around sort of middle of, of, of those two, you know, we sort of where your lowest ribs are and your hip bones, somewhere around the belly button uh, is the right place to um, measure your waist. And if you haven't got a tape measure, then a piece of string cut to the length that equals your height, so you might need help to get that piece of string cut to that length, uh, you should double it. And if that piece of string does not go all the way round when it's doubled, you are too fat, you, you, your, your waist size is too big. Um, and we ideally want that piece of string overlapping. Um, if you've got the tape measure, then your waist circumference should be less than your height, less than half of your height. Uh, so I'm five foot eight, that's 68 
is so my waist should not be any more than 34 inches. Um, so there's a couple of different ways that you can measure that, but it's a good idea to have that at the start as well. If you are pre-diabetic or diabetic, then um, if you haven't had your HbA1c done recently, we would encourage you to try and get that done as soon as possible so that again, we can monitor that and see how it goes as we go along. So the good news is, as I said, type two diabetes is reversible um, if we get you on the right path. Um, so it's really great news, not only for the individual, but it's great news for the NHS because the NHS is under a lot of strain from all the complications of diabetes as well as the drug budget. And the GPs who are having a lot of success now with diabetes are saving the NHS a fortune because so many of their patients have been able to come off their drugs. But obviously, we don't want you doing any of that without um, discussing it with your GP. So simple solution is if the problem with type 2 diabetes is it's too much sugar going into the system, then the easy way to reverse it is to stop eating the sugar. It's as simple as that. Problem is we are surrounded by it in our modern diets. So carbohydrates are made up of uh, molecules of um, glucose and simple carbohydrates are either monosaccharides, that's just one molecule in there, or maybe two disaccharides. Um, but an awful lot of the starches are just lots and lots of molecules of sugar. So anything that's starchy is basically sugar. And this is where a lot of people get confused. They think sugar is sugar, the stuff we add to a cup of tea or sprinkle over a cereal. No, what we're talking about is anything that is broken down into these molecules of sugar. And that is basically any starchy carbohydrate. So um, potatoes, rice, all the wheat flours, they all get broken down into sugar. And anything that is any other kind of sugar, it's not just the, the normal sugar, but coconut sugar or any of those things, they're basically all broken down to the same molecules and they're all bad for us. In nature, uh, Mother Nature, who I feel always knows best, own, she did not put carbohydrates and fat together in the same foods. Only man-made foods contain high, high quantities of carbohydrate and fat in combination. And the food manufacturers have discovered that this is the most amazingly addictive taste. It makes us want to eat more and more. Um, so all your cakes and biscuits and um, highly processed foods have got this combination and they just make us want to eat more and more. It's very hard for us to control our appetites when we're eating those combinations of foods. In nature, animal based foods contain fat and protein together and plant based foods contain carbohydrate and protein together. But non starchy plant based foods only contain very minimal amounts of simple carbohydrate and the process of digesting those because they're usually very fibrous foods uh, kind of helps to reduce the, the uh, absorption of the sugars and therefore if they're naturally occurring carbs in, in that form, um, they are nowhere near as damaging as the artificial carbohydrates. So you have to be mindful when you're looking at what you're eating to all the hidden sugars because um, people are, are aware of the cakes and biscuits and the obvious sugar, um, but they forget that there are all these other foods that have become part of the staple Western diet that are packed with carbohydrates. Most modern fruit now is so sweet that it is just like nature's candy. Um, if we were given, those of you that are of an age like me, I'm, I'm in my mid sixties now, we didn't have much fruit around when I was a child. It was very seasonal. And I bet if I could get hold of an apple that I ate when I was a child, I wouldn't like it now because it would be so bitter and tart. The manufacturers and the, the fruit growers have learned that man likes sweet things and therefore they have managed to uh, manipulate the fruits that we currently eat uh, to make them sweeter and sweeter and they become very addictive. But even if it's fruit, it, gets broken down to sugar. So we should be very moderate about the amount of fruit we eat. When they talk about five a day, we should really be eating five portions of vegetables a day, even though that's a made up number. There is no evidence that says how much we should be eating, but we really should be mainly eating vegetables um, and fruit should be a treat because it is basically sugar. 
So the manufacturers who want us to eat all this stuff that they're busy making because it's their business, they've come up with all sorts of clever alternative names to put on the labels so that we don't realize that it's all sugar. So this is just an example of the many, many different names for sugar that you will find on manufactured foods. We also try to get away from the idea of calories, calories in versus calories out. This is again, a kind of made up philosophy. Um, obviously in physics, where you've got a closed system, um, you, you, you can count the number of calories required to generate certain amount of heat, but our bodies are not closed systems like, like physics laboratories. Um, they, they handle each type of food very differently. So the simple idea that 200 calories, um, you know, equals X amount of energy in our bodies is not, it's not true. It's not accurate because the, depending on the type of food it is, depends um, very much on how it's handled by our body, how much energy it takes to digest it, how much of the energy from that food we actually absorb and goes into our bloodstream. Um, they're all very different. And what I've put on the screen here is an idea of two things that that roughly uh, equate to the same calorific value, a chocolate donut and a vegetable curry. Now, hopefully I don't need to tell any of you which is better for you. Um, and yet, if you were counting calories and you <laughs> really had a sweet tooth and, and you just loved cakes, you think, well, I can eat my 2000 calories today in donuts. I can have five or six donuts. That is not going to, to serve your body well at all. And you will put on weight, even though technically 2000 calories will be used up um, in, in, in your daily activities, because all of that is going to go straight into your bloodstream. Uh, it'll be broken down into the sugar molecules and it'll go straight into your blood. Whereas that vegetable curry is going to take a lot more digesting and there's a lot more nutrients in there that are going to do good things for your body and much less of the glucose that's in there. There's half the amount of carbs to start with, um, but what carbs there are, uh, many of them will be dissipated by the energy taken to actually digest the meal. So it's going to be much more beneficial to your body. And we talk about the three hungers, nutrient hunger, that's your body needing nutrients to, to keep it going, to keep it working efficiently. If you're very active, then you may need a bit more energy. Um, so we do need to eat for energy, but we can get energy from the fats and the proteins that we eat. We don't need carbohydrates. And obviously nowadays, we are lucky enough to have enough food around us that we can eat for pleasure. Early man ate to survive. There wasn't any notion of eating for pleasure then. You ate because you needed to eat to keep living. Now we are so overwhelmed with food that we eat far more than we need uh, and we actually eat now to enjoy it. And that's not a bad thing, but we need to understand what we should be eating and how much of it we should be eating. These charts um, have been created by one of our GPs that, that works with Public Health Collaboration, Dr. David Unwin, who's a very successful um, GP in managing low carb uh, lifestyles with his overweight and diabetic patients. And he felt that his patients needed to be helped to understand what he's talking about when he's talking about the amounts of, of sugar in foods. So he came up with these rather nice graphics um, that show you that the typical British breakfast, which is cereal based, is just a sugar fest. These are portions of 30 grams. Now, I would, would challenge anybody to tell me that they only eat 30 grams of cocoa pox or cornflakes. In a normal cereal bowl, they will just cover the bottom. Most people are probably eating three times that amount. And you can see how much is in 30 grams. If you're eating 90 grams, you're having more than a, a typical person's allowance for sugar in one day in that one meal. And that's before you've added the milk and before you've had the slice of toast that might go afterwards. Um, so it's really important that we get the hang of the fact that these very starchy carbohydrate based cereals are all really bad news when it comes to our blood sugar. The same goes, unfortunately, for things like rice and potatoes, um, whether we have our potatoes boiled or as French fries, um, they are still packed full of starch that gets turned to sugar. Pasta the same. Whereas when you come down to the bottom of this particular graph and you see something like broccoli, good green vegetables, there's virtually no sugar in there. And there's plenty of fiber as well. Uh, a banana, which is often heralded as one of the big healthy foods, an average banana 
uh, has the equivalent of six teaspoons of sugar in there, which is shocking. Um, and this is a, another chart with a banana at the top, but also showing you the different fruits. So when we talk about fruits on a low carb diet, we would encourage you to have the fruits that have got a very high fiber content compared to the weight and the berries, strawberries are here, but blueberries, blackberries, um, all of those sort of berries, they are the best fruits to eat if you, if you want to eat fruit, because there's so much fiber in those, the amount of sugar they've got really doesn't get a chance to impact. Um, our, our blood sugar in the same way that the other sweeter fruits do. So I'm quite sure some, something seems to have gone on, an arrow seems to appear on my screen, I don't know where it's come from, but uh, ignore that. So I understand that the vast majority of you are probably vegetarian. So I've put together here the sort of foods that we would be encouraging you to eat. And we would encourage all of you to buy the best quality of food that you can afford because again um, unfortunately supermarkets uh, and manufacturers have, have driven um, poor farming practices in a lot of the a, a lot of the the world um, and we want the best quality food we can possibly get which might mean buying from smaller suppliers or organic um, or free range as much as possible um, but you can base your diet, your diet, unless you're vegan, on dairy. But when we talk about dairy, we talk about full fat. Um, the low fat uh, dairy products will have had some of their goodness removed. And if you're talking about low fat yogurts, they will usually have added all sorts of other things to try and make those yogurts taste nice. Um, full fat yogurts, um, particularly Greek yogurt is delicious. Um, and the fat will not do you any harm at all. The fat is going to provide you with your energy because you're not going to be eating the carbs. Um, eggs are nature's perfect food and there is absolutely no link between egg consumption and cholesterol levels. Dietary, dietary um, cholesterol ha has nothing to do with people who have cholesterol issues uh, in their blood. Um, there's very, very complex digestive processes that go on. Um, fat that you eat doesn't just suddenly disappear through your, 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 your stomach and into your arteries. Um, and in another week, we'll explain a bit more about that, but we can eat as many eggs as we need to, um, to make healthy meals. And eggs are a wonderful convenience food and are a wonderful substitute for all those starchy breakfasts. Um, so eggs and then all vegetables that grow above the ground are the best because the tubers and the uh, root vegetables that grow below the ground, those, those roots are full of energy to sustain the leaves that grow above the ground. And so the root vegetables have got a higher carb content. Now, if you're vegetarian and you're not eating um, uh, as much protein and, and fat from other sources, you can get away with a bit more root veg than those of us that eat meat and fish. Um, but you should still veer towards more leafy vegetables and less of the root vegetables. Fat is another issue that the manufacturers have got their hands on. And a lot of the vegetable fats, sunflower oil and canola oil and things like that are highly processed oils that in themselves have got a lot of toxins and will do you a lot of harm. So when we talk about fats, we'd really rather you use cold pressed oils and true vegetable oils. I mean, vegetables don't have oil in them. <laughs> Um, olive oil, coconut oil, avocado oil, uh, these are oils that are produced by cold pressing of, of the fruits. Um, they are the healthiest. And if you're not, veg if you're not vegan um, and you, you do eat dairy, then ghee um, is another good um, source of, of um, fat and much better and healthier for you than the, pro the, the refined oils. So always look on a bottle of oil if you're buying it and it should tell you on the label how it was made. And if it talks about refined, you don't want to touch it because it's, uh, it's not a healthy oil at all. Fruit, we talk about, as I've mentioned, the berries being the best. Try and keep the more exotic. The sweeter the fruit, the more sugar there is in it. So try and keep those sweeter fruits uh, to a minimum. And please eat your fruit, don't drink it. So the standard British breakfast that shows a, a bowl of cereal and a great big glass of orange juice. This is just a sugar fest. That glass of orange juice will have more sugar in it than Coca-Cola. Um, and the trouble is because it's been um, blitzed, 
that sugar is going to go straight into your bloodstream. If you eat the orange, A, you couldn't possibly eat as many oranges as are in that glass, but also you'd be eating the fibre with it. Um, so please eat your fruit, don't drink it. For those of you that are vegetarian, the nuts and pulses are a very important source of protein for you. And the nuts contain healthy fats. Um, so these will help um, with your, your nutrient sort of balance. Um, and the pulses will also give you some protein uh, and bulk up your meals with, they do contain carbohydrates, but they contain quite a lot of fiber as well. Um, so they are generally very well utilized by the body. So avoid all processed foods. Anything that's been made in a factory, you should be aware of. Um, look at the ingredient list. And if there's names of stuff that you've never heard of on the side of that packet, then put it back on the shelf. If there are more than five ingredients or sugar appears as one of the first three ingredients, again, I would suggest you should put it back on the shelf. Vegetable oils, as I've said, please try not to, to have any of those, go for your, your nice cold pressed olives or coconut oil or whatever. Wheat based flour, I'm afraid whether it's gluten free or not, it's wheat based, it will get digested down to starch to sugars. So bread and pasta um, are really not great. Now, there are lots of really good low carb recipes that can be made with some of the nut flours. And over the weeks, we'll be talking about those. Um, and other starchy carbs, such as rice and other grains, again, need to be avoided as much as possible. If you are vegetarian and you really need some of those grains to help you, then things like buckwheat or the really wild rices that um, don't sort of boil down to the same starchy gloopiness that, that white rice does, they will be better in small quantities than having a bowl full of white rice. Um, so be very careful around those types of carbohydrates. So here I've got a sort of suggestion of some of the um, proteins and fats, nuts and seeds that you should be looking at making the mainstay of your diet. And these slides will be available via Panna. I'll email them to her. And if you email her, she can send you a set so that you pick up all of these. Um, but these are the things that you should be looking um, to have in your diet and reducing those very starchy carbohydrates to as close to zero as you can manage. So the take home message here is to focus on meals consisting of natural nutrient dense foods. We do not need to snack. Man is made and meant to have big gaps between meals. The whole way that our digestion works and our ability to utilize what we eat, um, we should have time to process the last meal before we are, are imposing the next one on our system. So if you're eating good nutrient dense foods with your meals, you shouldn't need to snack. So my suggestion, if you've been eating a pretty carbohydrate you know, diet for, for some time is not to try and tackle all three meals in one day, gradually work with one meal at a time and change it. And then hopefully you'll find that you, you don't get hungry between meals and you can, you can go without those snacks. And some people even get to the stage where they only need two meals a day. And some folk actually you know, function extremely well on one meal a day. Once they've got the nutrient quantities right, and we'll go on to talk about intermittent fasting and so forth in the weeks to come. But focus on one meal. And it depends what you what, what you're obviously what you like to eat. But if you have a typical sort of Western breakfast that's very starchy, I often find breakfast is the first meal that's worth looking at changing. Um, so avoid processed and anything that breaks down to sugar. Don't be fretting about the calories because when you start to eat fattier foods, there will be more calories in those fatty foods, but your body is going to utilize them better. So don't get hung up about the whole calories in, calories out idea. And remember that if there are lots of ingredients on the side of the packet, it's something that you really should be trying to avoid eating. I've put together a few resources here. A public health collaboration itself has got quite a lot of information on its website. There are a couple of really good um, websites for general uh, low carb uh, eating and Diet Doctor particularly has got an awful lot of really great videos um, that explain more than I can explain in the time available uh, about this whole way of eating. I have managed to find um, some 
keto vegetarian keto by the way is just another word for very low carb when we talk about going keto we're talking about going really low carb for people who are diabetic my 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 advice would be to try and get your carbohydrate intake under 100 grams a day um, but those of you that aren't diabetic um, can go as low carb as you want straight away um, but keto is usually considered to be anything less than 20 grams of carbohydrate a day so um, don't worry about the word keto it just means extremely low carb but there are some good um, vegetarian recipes on that keto vegetarian recipes.com and I've also found um, a, a lady who she's not Asian but um, she's keto and vegan so again she's been experimenting with a lot of good keto vegan breads uh, flatbreads and um, buns and all sorts of different types of breads um, that those of you perhaps if you are vegan uh, may find interesting I, I find her useful to watch even though I'm not vegan or vegetarian uh, she's got some great ideas and I'll keep looking for more and more I like to sort of review them before I recommend them but um, those two websites I can certainly recommend to you at the moment um, so that's all I wanted to say. Um, a lot of information there, but it's really setting the scene to help um, go, go forward. I'll stop sharing the screen now so that we can all see each other again. And I'm hoping that Dacha and Davina have been keeping an eye on, on the questions um, so that we can really sort of set you off for the first week. So I do that. Stop sharing. Hi, I can hear you, Davina. So um, there have been a few questions. Kailash is asking about the fruit. What about oranges and such greeners? Okay, well, oranges, as I say, if you eat them um, in small quantities, then if you're not diabetic, you just have to be mindful that they 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 will trigger. What happens, you see, when, when you trigger um, a lot of sugar going into your blood, the insulin will get released. And if you're still sensitive to insulin, that insulin will remove the sugar very quickly from your bloodstream and you will get hungry again. So the higher the spike of sugar you get, the, the lower the sort of drop you'll get from when the insulin comes into your system and therefore you'll be hungry again sooner. So if you have foods that are lower in carb and higher in fat and protein, they won't cause that insulin spike and they'll satisfy you for longer. If you're diabetic, you also don't want these great surges of sugar coming into your blood because your system might not be clearing it very well and then you'll end up with a higher blood sugar. So for both groups, I would keep the sweeter fruits to a minimum. And when you do eat them, eat them as a sort of with a meal. So after your main meal or whatever, not as a snack in the middle. And that way they get digested down with the other foods that you've eaten and will have less of an impact. Okay, um, Bimla has asked about um, carrots as they grow underground and also about rapeseed oil. Is that good oil for you? Rapeseed, again, we'll, we'll get on when we talk about fats, we'll be talking about omega-3s and omega-6s and, and sort of the, the best balance. And cold-pressed rapeseed is definitely a lot better than um, the highly processed vegetable oils. Um, but I would put rapeseed at the bottom of the priority list of, of the good oils. But it's certainly, if it's cold pressed, it's much better for you than the uh, highly refined sunflower or vegetable oils. Okay, Leela said, is any cereals good for diabetics? And Rashmi's asking about millet flour instead of wheat flour. So did you say any cereals? Yeah, are they, can, can diabetics have any cereals? Um, we would prefer not, <laughs> basically. All cereals get broken down to sugar. It doesn't matter what the manufacturers stick on the box. Um, if they're made from starchy carbs, which most, the you know, vast majority, even good old fashioned porridge, unfortunately, particularly when I say good old fashioned, the problem is it's not old fashioned. Um, the, all of these cereals are highly refined these days. Um, they've been messed around with the, you know, the porridge that we would eat today would have no comparison to the porridge that our parents would have eaten um, in terms of the oats that went into making that porridge in the first place. Um, so all of the modern ones break down much more quickly. They've got much less of the natural fiber left in them. And therefore any cereal, unfortunately, is really better left out of your diet if you can manage it. 
and millet. Um, I did look it up and I can't remember. Can you do you know Dacha? What the carb count for, for oh, millet you is? Can't get her off mute. <laughs> Sorry, you can't, you can't get, get her off mute. Maybe she can I type. Ah, hi. Um, yeah, I just um, had a quick Google and uh, Wikipedia, so I don't know how accurate that is, said millet is 73% carbohydrate compared to wheat, which is 71% carbohydrate. That's worse. <laughs> so, yeah, so yeah. it's gluten free millet. So yeah. it has potential health benefits for people who are gluten intolerant. Um, but for a diabetic who wants to reduce their carbohydrate load, it's really not recommended. There's one of the things that I haven't sort of explained yet, we'll, we'll, we'll try and do bits every week, but when you eat a lot of carbohydrate, the body turns excess carbohydrate into fat. Mm. So carbohydrate um, is what causes us to get fat, not fat. So it's much better to base your meals on um, a good, good portion of protein and fat um, and much less carbohydrate because we'll utilize the fat for energy. There are fat soluble vitamins, there are nutrients in fat that we need. There is absolutely nothing of any benefit to the body in carbohydrates other than energy, but we can get that energy from other sources. And the um, problem with most of us these days is we're eating far, far too much in the way of carbohydrates. And therefore all of those carbs are getting converted into fat. They get stored in our liver and then they get sent all around the body, deposited under our skin, around our middles, um, but also around our organs very often causing huge problems. So it's carbohydrates that get turned into the fat that we don't like. It's not fat that makes us fat. Very hard to overeat fat as well you know, much harder to overeat on fat than it is to overeat on carbs. So these are all the things that you have to kind of get used to thinking about when you're planning your meals. Um, fat is also, good healthy fats can make meals much more tasty. So all these leafy vegetables we're talking about, if they're cooked in a little bit of butter, if you, if you eat dairy, coconut oil, if you don't eat dairy or good olive oil, um, you can really make your vegetables much more tasty and much more satisfying because you're taking on board that fat. So. Um, Amanda's, um, said, you know, you asked about the question about healthy diets. So Amanda's saying, yes. um, she used to think that whole grain was healthy, lots of fruit and veg and rice, but she knows better now. Um, but she's also said um, she recommends um, for a uh, vegetarian keto diet, um, Dr. Will Cole. There's a website. She said Dr. that. Dr. Who? Dr. Will Cole. Oh, yeah, I think I've heard of him. I'll, I'll have another look at his, but I think he's, he's fine. Yeah. And she said also she's asking about any thoughts on cold pressed organic sunflower oil purely for mixing with olive oil to make mayonnaise. If it's cold pressed, it should be a lot healthier because it'll be made from the seeds and, and they'll be extracting what bit of oil there is. Uh, if it's cold pressed and there's no refining going on. Um, but again, the omega-3, omega-6 balance is probably not as good. Mm. Um, so avocado oil, um, olive oil um, and coconut oils are probably the best oils to be uh, using or ghee. Yeah, for Indian cooking, I use a lot of ghee and, mm. and coconut oil. That's, those are the two main ones I use. Um, Kim was asking about sorghum flour and juar. I mean, I think generally flowers are not that great, are they? I've just put a link on. Um, I don't know if everyone can see it in the chat. Um, and yeah, it's got sorghum flour on that. And again, um, it's not it's not great. No, you know it's not given a percentage, but it's given um, per I think a quarter cup or half a cup or something. It's got a lot of grains listed, so people yeah. can compare, have a look at that, and compare. Yeah, I've bought, I've looked at buying sorghum noodles before now, thinking they might be better, but they're not. They've still got quite a high carb content. Mm. You can get konjac noodles, which are made from a, a, a root, a very fibrous root. And they've basically got no nutrients in them at all, but they make them into sort of noodles and rice. They're, they're fairly tasteless. Um, so you need to really dress them up with a lot of flavors. Um, but if you really, really feel your plate is missing those sort of noodly things, they're not going to affect your blood sugar at all. And they give you the bulk. 
But to be honest, if you can get into it and look up some of the recipes that on the websites that we've mentioned, uh, there's great ways of using vegetables to substitute for rice, cauliflower rice. Um, actually, what I must put on is a link to uh, another project I'm involved with where we're, we're developing little videos of, of great recipes for low carb. Um, and there's one for cauliflower rice. And you can make fantastic equivalent to rice uh, to go with your curries and, and so forth with cauliflowers or broccoli. Um, cabbage, shredded cabbage, wilted down with a bit of ghee or, or again, your oils. Um, that makes a fantastic base for your curries. You know, it's kind of ingrained in our heads that we have to have rice with these things, but you don't. Um, if you've got a tasty curry, uh, you just need something to accompany it. There are lots of great vegetables that you can use to substitute. And, and this one. Salads on the side. And salad, yeah. yeah. Like a big, you know, big salad with whatever vegetables you like. I mean, dressy with like lemon and olive oil and um, yeah. vegetables. But if you actually want to stick your curry on something because you're used to sticking it on rice, then cauliflower, or indeed, I often do a combination of cauliflower and broccoli, um, and it's really tasty, um, and it, it's a great substitute, and even my hubby, who doesn't need to worry about his weight, but he's getting the message that he should still worry about what he eats, um, and he's really taken to it now. Um, it's quite well. Yeah, yeah. Um, also, like um, um, people are asking about, if you don't eat eggs, what can you be with, have for breakfast? Um, I mean, I have yogurts and yes. berries. Greek yogurt. If you haven't tasted full fat Greek yogurt, um, you really need to. It's, it's I think, a, something made in heaven. It's just delicious. It's so creamy um, and so filling. Um, and I have yogurt and berries. I, mean, I don't eat breakfast much these days. I've gone on to two meals a day because since I've gone low carb, that's all I need. I do just don't need food first thing in the morning. But if I am having something, because perhaps I'm going to be out at lunchtime, a bowl of, of blueberries and, and strawberries or raspberries, depending on the season. And what I'm doing now is buying them frozen and I just um, sort of you know warm them up um straight out of the freezer and actually it's really nice the combination of warm and cold uh, and i have those with with some greek yogurt and it's a very satisfying breakfast there's also homemade granola that's sugar free made with nuts and seeds um, that's really useful to go with the yogurt so yogurt um full fat yogurt um is a great uh, breakfast food can I also add something about breakfast? Yeah. Breakfast is um, something where we think of breakfast as toast, cereal, all of the, those things. And it's the, the food companies, you know, <laughs> Kellogg's um, that have set us to believe that breakfast has to be those things. If you think about your grandparents based in India, they weren't eating bread and, um, you know, cereal. They, they were maybe eating the evening's leftover meals. Um, it, so you've got to kind of stop thinking about breakfast in the way we've conditioned to think about it and you just got to think about it as the first meal of the day which can be anything that's low carb that you enjoy and it, you know when I first changed from um, eating a standard diet um, I struggled with breakfast a lot even though I eat eggs I didn't want to eat eggs every morning it was just not something I wanted to do I was used to toast mainly most mornings um, so I just started to eat other other meals that I would have had, you know, I, I would just make more in the evening and just eat. Because if you're hungry, you will eat it. It's just, mm -hmm. we're just conditioned to think yes. it's got to be this and it's got to be that. And it's changing our mindset, which is really, yeah. really important. Absolutely. I mean, when, when, when you go abroad, I can remember going um, many years ago to Hong Kong and uh, in the international sort of hotels, it's amazing the variety of food they have on offer at breakfast because various different cultures do eat all sorts of things at mm. breakfast time. And, and you know, our British reaction was, oh my goodness, would you have that first thing in the morning? But there is no rule. Our bodies aren't designed that they'll only eat certain things at a certain time of the day. We eat what you fancy um, that's good for you. <laughs> as trouble as we could fancy things that aren't good for us. Um, but no, there's no rules. So have what you like. And, and leftovers from the night before are often a very good idea um mm. because they're quick because most of us want a quick breakfast because we're usually in a rush either because we've got to get out or we're trying to get other members of the family out um so just break up the rule book uh but concentrate on eating those 
whole and healthy foods and keeping the carbs to an absolute minimum. Um, because I promise you, you will feel less hungry, but you've, you've got to start making the transition. So um, breads as well, there are some low carb breads made with the likes of almond or coconut um, that can take the place, not every day necessarily, but can take the place of, of a sandwich for lunch. Uh, and again, on our little video link that I'll, I'll, I'll add it to the slides to send out. Um, we've got a nice um, bread roll recipe that's made with almond flour. It does have eggs in it. So if you don't eat eggs. Um, you can substitute it with food. Yeah, well, there, there, there is the vegan website. I've given you the Keto Vegan. She makes um, bread rolls without the eggs. So you'll pick up recipes there. Uh, it's just about like any any eating plan, any healthy sort of diet, whether you've done, you know, all the old fashioned sort of calorie control diets or whatever, they all take a bit of thinking about and organizing. To eat healthily, you do need to plan ahead. You need to have the right things in the house. It's challenging if you live with other people um, who don't want to know about healthy eating. Um, the ideal is to be able to get rid of all the rubbish and not have it there sitting, looking at you saying, eat me, eat me. Um, but if you do eat, live with other people who insist on having a store cupboard full of cakes and biscuits, then you know, you've know kind of got to learn the discipline of, of not going there. Um, but if you start eating healthy meals that are satisfying, you won't need the snacks. An awful lot of our snacking is habit. You know, a certain time of day, you have a cup of tea, you automatically have a biscuit with it. Um, you don't have to have that biscuit, it's, it's habit. We also think we're hungry when we're just mildly, you know, starting to get ready for our next meal. And we think, oh, I feel slightly hungry, I must eat. You know, we, we, we need to go back to remembering that our bodies are designed to not be handling food 24 seven. Uh, in order to give our bodies a really good chance to process what we have eaten, we need big gaps between our meals. Um, and eating constantly is really bad for us. I think when you start eating the right foods, you also yeah. feel less hungry. Yeah. It's actually the wrong foods that are actually making you yes. hungry. And There's... also um, not drinking enough water. You know, sometimes you're actually thirsty rather than hung hungry. Yes. Um, um, somebody's asking about um, bread. If you have some bread, um, is it better to eat it from the, like frozen and then toast it? So somebody said it's mostly yeah, there's been Yeah, there's been a little bit of work on, on how you can make carbs a bit more resistant so that they don't get digested. But to be honest, if it's kind of standard British white bread to start with, it's going to get broken down very quickly to carbs, you know, to sugar, no matter what you do. I did spot somebody talking about chia pudding and things like that. Um, and chia seeds are great because if you soak them, they can go into a gel and they can be mixed into yogurts. And, uh, and um, there's some qu quite a lot of good recipes if you look for them on the, the websites using chia seeds. Um, so they can be quite useful. You can prepare them the night before and then they're kind of ready for, for the morning. Um, there's all sorts of ideas once, once you get going. Somebody else has put on traditional Greek breakfast um, feta, cheese and eggs and tomato along with uh, the Greek yogurt, um, you know, or just a, a feta cheese um, um, and egg tomato sort of salad for breakfast. Yeah, and you could put olives in there. Yeah. Um, but can I add um, another point? Um, it's really important, you know, why you want to do this. You, yes. You've got to really that mm. you've got to have set your intention what is your mm. intention is it because you want to be able to be healthy for your grandchildren to see them grow up do you want to not be a burden on your family as you get older that was my drive for me when I when I changed my diet and I had to give up all grains I don't eat any grains at all um, so um, so it depends what your motive is you know is that chapati more important than spending time with your grandchildren you know, um, so it's, it's your mindset. You've really got to adjust your mindset. Also, it all sounds impossible. You know, giving up grains does sound impossible and it sounded impossible to me. Um, it's really important to think that you have to relearn really cooking, that you kind of have to start from scratch. It's, it's hard, but it's so worth it. You know, you'll, you'll notice if you do it quite strictly, you'll notice the health benefits really, really very quickly. Um, 
but that that's entirely up to you i'm not saying what you should do i'm just saying um you know it's good to have um a reason why know your why why you're doing this absolutely i totally agree and and it's it's you know as i said at the beginning think about food as fuel for your body none of us would dream of putting the wrong fuel in our cars because we know it can be really expensive if we do <laughs> Apart from the fact you'll break down. Um, and, and yet we, we abuse our bodies so much. We look after most of the machines that we've got in our modern lives better than we look after our bodies. And I think we've really got to get back to a bit of basics about mm. thinking, what is this food going to do for me? Apart from a moment, you know, the old wives tell you, a moment on the lips, a lifetime on the hips. That's sort of a joke about it, but it's, it's doing more than that. It's not just going on our hips, making us feel bad about ourselves. It's actually doing us harm as well. Um, so it really is, um, but motivation is what gets you going. Habit is what keeps you going. And it's developing good habits. Um, and uh, one of the tricks I've learned from one of the slimming clubs that I would now no longer <laughs> recommend, but you know, they, they said, if you think you feel hungry, have a have a drink glass of water or a cup of tea or whatever have that drink and if in half an hour you still feel hungry maybe you do need to eat but a handful of nuts or something is a really good uh, healthy snack to have if you really feel you can't last out till your next meal but have that drink get yourself going on some task or other and you'll probably find that an hour has gone by and you haven't actually thought about food um we're, we're just very very readily able to give in to hunger these days because we have so much snacky food around and it's reminding ourselves that we don't if you've had a decent meal a couple of hours ago you do not need more food you're just wanting more food and it's getting the mindset right um to you know be fueling our bodies correctly and um you know there's a few good comments coming on here and somebody's asking about sourdough bread Good artisan sourdough bread is certainly an awful lot better than the mass produced bread. Um, and again, it all depends what you're wanting and what, where you're up to, whether you're a diabetic or just wanting to lose weight. A small amount of sourdough bread is going to be a lot better than a slice of white, um, but it's still going to be broken down to carbs in the end. So, you know, moderation very much, um, but it's, it's, you know, it's not what I call a banned substance, but it's, it's certainly not to be eaten regularly. Uh, somebody talked about um, uh, the best flour for roughly, um, for roti. Um, there is a um, firm which does low carb flour called Longevity. Yes. The actual um, thing, and you can make rotis out of those. I think it mainly uses things like linseed. But like you said, yes. I think there's websites which allow you to make low carb breads and. Um, and yes, I would have a look at that keto, the YouTube keto lady, because she's made flat breads and things. They may not be exactly, you know, we, we, we can't give you an exact hmm. alternative, but there are good substitutes um, that might fill the place of those things. Um, and it's about prioritizing your health over, you know, habit of, of things that you've always eaten. Um, and, you know, if you do well with this and, and lose weight or get your diabetes under control or even reverse it, it's not to say you can never, ever have any of these things again, but it's it's about learning to have them just as as treats as opposed to staple uh, things that you're eating lots of day in, day out. Uh, and most of us find our taste buds change. I mean, I used to have the ultimate sweet tooth. Uh, and now I can eat 90% cocoa chocolate and, and thoroughly enjoy it. Uh, and, and if I have um, milk chocolate now, I, I absolutely hate it. But I wouldn't have believed you a few years ago if you told me I'd make that change. Um, so view sweet treats as very much that treats like they were in most of our childhoods um, when they weren't available so much. Um, and base your, your main meals on savory, healthy, uh, low carb but you can you can have the, the high fat um, that's going to and you must add fat to your food when you go low carb because otherwise you will be hungry you need that fat to satisfy you so sorry don't be afraid of ghee. Really. Yeah, don't be afraid of fat. I mean, I chuck butter into everything now uh, and it makes it so much tastier, but it also makes it much more um, satisfying. And the other thing that you might find you need to add a bit more of is salt. 
Um, if you're using a lot of processed foods, there will be a lot of salt in those foods. And if, you know, we've been discouraged from adding salt to our cooking and salt at the table uh, over the years because we were having too much salt, but that's because a lot of the processed foods were full of salt. Once you get rid of the processed foods, we do need some salt. Um, so you might find, sorry, no, uh, good quality salts, um, sea salt or Himalayan pink salt or whatever. Um, but you will find you, you might get muscle cramps and things if, you, if you're not having enough salt. Um, so just be mindful of that if you're ditching the processed foods. Um, there's questions about quinoa, is that good for you? And the brown rice. And I was asking about the um, diabetics, do they need to have three meals a day? No, I mean, e even diabetics can, if they get good control, can, can um, you know, reduce how frequently they eat. If you're an insulin dependent diabetic, then obviously you've got to be very careful and you need to sort of do it with medical supervision. Um, but um, there are a lot of diabetics out now there who, who have gone down to two meals a day. Um, so um, it's, it's about, again, getting the right nutrients and making sure you're having a nutrient dense diet, but it doesn't have to be three meals a day as such. Um, quinoa is a good quality vegetable protein. So for um, vegans, sort of vegetarians, but particularly vegans, it can be a useful source of protein. Um, but what was the other one that was mentioned? Brown rice. Um, brown rice. Brown rice, I'm afraid. No, it's no better than white rice. It's just carbs, unfortunately. Uh, the, the, the very sort of tough little grains, the wild rice and this red rice and black rice now, they tend to keep more of their husk and be less broken down. So if you must have rice, they're a bit better. But bottom line is all rice ends up being digested as carbs. Yeah, and if you are going to have those rices that you've just mentioned that are slightly better, you really, really need to limit it to a yes. very, very small amount. Yeah. yeah. Um, when I was eating rice, it was huge amounts, you know. Yeah. Um, it was like, and I'm sure traditionally that's how everyone eats rice in, in our culture. Um, so it's it, portion control, if you really can't give up something, is so yeah. vital. Yeah. You need to be looking at the packets, getting familiar with, you know, the amount of carbohydrates per 100 grams. And it's quite shocking when you look at some of them, just how high a percentage of carbs there are. And when you're looking at labels, the manufacturers, again, try to be cute and, and say only three grams of sugar or whatever on the front of a packet. If you turn it around and look, there may be 30 grams of carbohydrate in there, of which... Mm three grams are glucose, but all of that carbohydrate will ultimately get broken down to sugar. So don't be fooled by that. Look at the total carbs uh, in a food and um, you'll get some shocks, I think, if you look at some of the things that you thought were healthy. Um, so you really want to stay away from anything that's got significant amounts of carbohydrate in it. It's best to stick to um, real foods and keep away from the processed foods. The processed foods do really make you hungry. I never used to be able to go without breakfast. I used to get headaches. Um, and when I started cleaning up my diet, I found that I could miss the mm. breakfast and not feel ill at all. Yeah. You know, and I don't even feel hungry. So I'm obviously keeping busy as well. Um, Kailash is asking about honey. Honey is like... Honey sugar, <laughs> unfortunately. I think it's honey, but it is sugar in the end. So, yeah. it's, it's slightly healthier than refined white sugar. And occasionally it might be used to sweeten, you know, a teaspoon in a whole recipe uh, might be used as a sweetener. And obviously in the, the quantity that each portion will have will be very small. So you will occasionally see it in low carb cooking, um, but it's not something that you can just dive into as just coconut sugar as well. You know, the manufacturers, when they start to cotton on that things are getting getting popular, they'll try hard to cash in on it. Mm -hmm. So you get all these things being sold to us as healthy, like coconut sugar and what have you, but unfortunately they are just still sugar um, and it's gonna have the same effect on your body. Um, there's questions about um, amaranth flour and chestnut flour. I don't know if they're low carb. And multigrain Amar as well. Yeah, amaranth is a grain. Um, I think any grain, any multigrain flowers come up, any grain, it's unfortunately, it's a carbohydrate. Oh, good, aren't they? Sorry? It's, it's the seasons. 
uh, almond flour and coconut. Yeah, the nut, the nut flours are the best because nuts are principally fat and protein, um, and therefore uh, there's very little carbs um, in those per hundred grams. Um, so they and, and things like flaxseed. Um, a lot of the breads I make have uh, flaxseed along with either almond or coconut, um, and that gives a nice texture um, and keeps the carb count very low. Fatima's asking about couscous. Mm. Oh. <laughs> Just look on the packets when you when you when you go back into your kitchens. If, if you've still got the packaging, just look at the um, nutritional label, and you'll see. The amount of carbohydrate per hundred gram, and it, it'll probably give you a bit of a surprise. Yeah, it is an eye opener. For it sure. is, but the, the old coconut, no coconut, cauliflower um, is a good substitute for the sort of couscous. I used to do, use a lot of couscous, uh, and the the um, cauliflower, um, when you either grate it or I tend to use a food processor to to chop it into nice little little pieces. Um, it's a great substitute for all the things I used to do with couscous. So, um, you know, use I, veggies more creatively. Yeah, I really enjoy cauliflower rice with my curries um, yeah. and my Indian cooking. Easy um, to make as well. Yeah, it's simple to make. 100 sorry, 100, 90% cocoa, um, chocolate's good. It's yes. Content of fat is the fat. Yeah, cocoa is very good for us um, and, you know, um, you can't eat an awful lot. Well, I, I defy anybody to eat a lot of high percentage if it's preferably 90, but over 80 percent cocoa um, solids um, is generally pretty good. And you won't you won't be taking many carbs in with a, a small amount of that. Uh, and it's actually got lots of benefits as well, but it satisfies, if I, again, if, you know, but I've got the munchies and it's not meal time. Um, a, a few nuts will help or a square of dark chocolate. I don't want to eat anything else for ages after I've had a square of dark chocolate. I don't know what it does to your taste buds, but it satisfies me and it stops me sort of craving other things. Um, if you're used to only eating milk chocolate, then I would probably start at 70%, but don't kid yourself, you can eat loads of 70%, but get the taste for 70% and then gradually, as your up. taste buds change, you can build up to the 80 plus. Um, and that's something I always have in the cupboard for emergencies. <laughs> um, Amanda's um, said a um, very good point. She said, I think at the beginning, it's hard to imagine you won't be able to. Yeah. You won't be hungry every few hours but if you stick to it your body adapts so quickly absolutely i wouldn't encourage anybody to skip a meal until you've got yourself onto a low carb sort of program um but certainly hopefully if you start replacing the carbs in your main meals with the fats and proteins that we're talking about then you'll find you won't want to snack and then eventually you can get on to thinking about even leaving a meal out the, the other thing we talk about is you know we're, we're apart from being conditioned as to what we have for certain meals like you know we've all got this obsession about cereal and toast for breakfast and a sandwich for lunch um there's no rules about any of this um so um you know just just we, we're also conditioned to think we must eat it's it's one o'clock i've not had my lunch i must have my lunch if you're not hungry don't eat you know, the, the, again, this, this idea that you must always be eating at certain times of the day. And I, I used to tell my husband off terribly for um, not having breakfast because he never wanted to have breakfast when he was working. And I used to worry about him going off to work without breakfast. And now he's thrilled that I can <laughs> finally say, oh, don't worry about it. We don't want breakfast. Um, and now I'm the one who used to be mad about breakfast and I never have it. Um, but, you know, you, you will adapt eventually. Um, but you know, don't force yourself to eat. If you're not hungry, leave it. Your body's saying, I'm not ready for more food yet. And you know, I have something to eat a bit later. Amanda said that cauliflower um, is a good substitute for couscous. Um, Bhavna's asking about milk, um, you know, whether it has a lot of sugar because she loves drinking more milk. Okay, well, whole milk um rather than semi-skimmed you're, you're not you know again it, it amuses me that we all got sold this semi-skimmed milk and and the difference is only two percent fat 
uh, but the flavour is so much better with whole milk. But yes, milk does contain lactose. It's quite a small quantity per 100 mils, but um, if you're wanting to go low carb and particularly wanting to lose weight and, and or um, deal with diabetes, then you shouldn't be drinking pints and pints of milk because you will be taking on board a lot of lactose. If you tolerate milk, then it does form part of a healthy diet, but you do need to be aware of the carb count. I'm just asking about chickpea atta and savouries like fried sana dal. I mean, anything fried is always fried in the wrong, wrong oils. So it's not good for you at all. Mm. Yeah. Um, if you make it home, you should be fried with um, coconut. Yeah. So be careful with the fat. Chickpeas, yeah. again, for vegetarians, um, they are a useful source of protein, but, you know, they have got carbs in them, so you need to watch and get the balance right. But um they can be useful um but you know it's all about not having these things all the time and trying to get the lower carb foods to be the mainstay i think you need to start off slowly you know everyone has their own journey mm. some people stop you know straight away and cut everything and other people might want to reduce things so like have less chapatis and then yeah stop the breads first so that's how i did i did it in turns like stop the bread first then the cereal um yeah and, and i did it or like overnight i cut everything out overnight um and that worked for me because if i ever tried to cut anything out in moderation um the cravings remain yeah. and i just can't do it I, mm. the, the, they take hold the cravings yeah. um so i'm useless doing it slowly so it's an individual thing so yeah. it's you know there's no right or wrong way uh, it's no, what works I, for you yeah uh, it's making sure you get good nutrients um but for some people um particularly you know you'll all be eating differently now anyway um but i would usually suggest that in in the uk breakfast is one of the worst meals in terms of carbs and therefore if you want to tackle it bit by bit then breakfast is probably the first meal to really look at but if you don't currently have a very carby breakfast then maybe have a look at what you're having for lunch or your evening meal or you can do that just method which you know for some people particularly if you've got that motivation and that commitment you know go for it um you might feel if you're eating a lot of carbs now and you suddenly drop them all you can have a couple of days of feeling a bit rough Mm. Um, but if you've got the uh, oomph, have plenty of fluids um, and just keep on going, you will come through that and you'll feel so much better. Yeah, so I'd say the first sort of week's bad, the first sort of 10 days still aren't brilliant. Um, after about two weeks, it, you, you, you sometimes get what they call tiger blood. You're just full of energy and you feel like um, you're 10 years younger. I'm not even kidding you. Mm. It's quite incredible. Yeah, people um, talk about mental fog being lifted, mm. being able to concentrate better. Uh, there's a huge number of benefits that you can feel in yourself. It's not just what your body is experiencing, but, you know, you, the, in, in the way you feel sleep may improve, although we will talk more about uh, sleep and exercise in the next couple of weeks. Um, but, um, yeah, lots of people feel huge, huge benefits quite quickly. But if you go for it very quickly, very suddenly, then... Don't be downhearted if you feel a bit rough for the first week or yeah. so. Expect that. It's called kind of keto flu or something. You just feel really tired and exhausted yeah. and increase, put a little, if you, you know, a few uh, grains of salt in your glass of water or something, mm -hmm. just to make sure your um, electrolytes yeah. um, are balanced so, because yeah, when you cut out what, carbs, yeah. nothing changes in your body. Carbs tend to make you hold on to as well. When you're having a lot of carbs and you're driving a lot of insulin, insulin makes your kidneys hold on to salt. So when you drop the carbs, you start to wee a lot um, and you can lose a lot of salt, which is why they say put salt in your, in your water. Um, but you, you might find you're running to <laughs> quite a lot in the first day or two if you really go for it. Somebody's asking here about almond milk and coffee, not, not, not together two separate questions uh yeah i mean i object to it being called milk when it's just ground arm <laughs> almonds that have been blitzed up with water but if you don't like dairy um again watch it look at the packet because some almond milk have got other things in them the better quality products will just be the almonds and water um but you don't want any extraneous sugar or anything creeping in because they've sweetened it um 
and if you if you like almond milk and you'd rather drink that than dairy then fine um, ke ke sorry well, it's the best to look at the back of the packet for the ingredients. oh yeah look at the ingredients absolutely um, i'd just like to add that almond milk's so easy to make at home yeah it's so easy you just need a high speed blender you just soak the nuts overnight um change the water add a bit of salt blitz it in um a certain amount of you know with the almonds with a certain amount of water um, and yeah. you can leave it with the bits in or you can get a nut bag which is like a just like a, a bag that lets keeps all the the pulp Definitely. yeah the pulp and just lets um you strain out the the milk um i think we make that every other day mm. um i don't particularly drink it but my daughter and my husband do like that yeah. um so they do that and it's probably works out cheaper than the shop bought ones because if you want a really good quality almond milk, they're not cheap. No, no, beware the ones that are cheap because they're probably the ones that have got all sorts yeah. of other yeah. stuff. In They've there. usually got rice and all kinds of things in them. Yeah. Um, coffee, coffee is another one of these things that it's got good and bad. Um, the recommendation for those of us that are sensitive to caffeine is to only drink coffee in the morning. Try, try not to drink it after midday, otherwise it can affect sleep. Um, and the, you know, it's kind of got its pros and cons. So a little bit, um, I think most people would agree is, is healthy, but too much coffee then it's like alcohol really. <laughs> a glass of red wine is okay, but the bottle is not. Uh, and coffee, I think similarly, um, if you overdo it, it can be bad for you. But if you like coffee, particularly in the morning, then that's fine. Obviously, if you're going low carb, um, your, your lattes and all the rest of it are, are a no-no. Um, I put cream in my coffee, um, which is absolutely, I love it. Um, but um, some people put uh, blitz it with some butter or coconut oil, um, call it bulletproof coffee for reasons that I don't fully understand. But um, it's amazing. It makes it a bit like a latte. If you've got a, a hand blender and you put a little bit of coconut oil uh, or butter or a bit of both. Um, some people use the very highly refined, not refined in a bad way, but um, the very pure um, MCT oil, which is the best of the, the coconut oil. Um, but any of those and blitz it with your blender, it kind of turns into that milky colour that a latte would be. And it does actually taste quite nice. But you've got to be aware that... Yeah, it's quite nice and cinnamon. Sorry? A bit of cinnamon in it. A bit of nice. cinnamon, yeah. Mm. Yeah. I'm thinking about high blood pressure. So there's lots of different things. You know, what we're doing here is not just about a diet. Yeah. You've got to think about it as a whole, you know, changing your whole life. Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, I've been eating this way, um, no grains for ooh, um, five and a half years. So, you know, um, it, it sounds impossible when you're at the start of your journey. Yeah. But when you, you know, when you get rewarded with the health benefits, it's, it's really, really worth it. And then sometimes yeah. I might sort of eat something that I shouldn't eat too, anyway, I eat something that I shouldn't really eat because it's maybe Christmas or something. Yeah. And straight away, I, yeah. immediately I think, oh, I, it was fun. It was enjoyable, but I really want to go back to how yeah. I eat. Yeah. It, uh, you, interesting. It, yeah, it is interesting. And I mean, I, I say I used to have the ultimate sweet tooth and the idea of giving up all the, the, the baked goodies. Um, you know, I just thought, oh, I'll never do it. But I have. And now, just like that, she says, at Christmas, I eat some of the stuff because it's there. And A, I can't eat anything like the quantities I used to eat. And B, I can't wait for Christmas to be over to go back to eating the way I normally eat now um, because I just feel so sluggish and so bleh. Um, so, um, you know, you have to have the faith that uh, if you can make the changes and um, whether the first couple of weeks you will really reap the benefits and particularly if you've got diabetes, um, it will make a huge difference just spotted somebody said bulletproof coffee is supposed to keep you fuller longer and that's absolutely it that that bit of fat whether it's the, the butter or ghee or um, oil that you put in gives that satiation to the, the coffee and and some people that's all they have for breakfast you know that's that that is their breakfast um so it's again a matter of taste yeah okay. uh, uh, have you seen the question about the pulses like the mung beans yes. and the, the dal oh. lentils and things 
Well, again, for, for people who are vegan or vegetarian, they can be a, 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 an important part of the uh, protein. Um, there's usually quite a bit of fiber in those. So although they are carby, um, they aren't as bad as, as the flowers and things we've been talking about. Uh, and it's all about moderation really of those things, especially for those that don't eat meat. If you eat meat or fish, poultry, um, then you shouldn't need anything like the quantities of pulses. Um, you haven't got the same reason to be eating them as somebody who's vegan might have in order to get the protein. So it's about adjusting um, the nutrients. And the, what you feel that, yeah, Yeah, and also um, dals and lentils and all of those kind of um, beautiful traditional meals can be um, padded out with vegetables. You know, you can put some chopped up courgettes, it kind of disappears. It just means you reduce the amount of um, the carbohydrate content, you increase the nutritional content. Um, so you can do things. And OK, it won't taste exactly like you are used to. But again, it's, it's why. Why are you doing this? Mm. You know, um, if you aren't willing to budge on taste, then um, then the journey is going to be very difficult. Mm. To be honest with the seasonings, I mean, most of the herbs and spices and things you can use just as you've always mm. done. Uh, and I think that's half the key is making sure it's still tasty, but yeah. changing the proportions as Dacia says. So where it might have been predominantly lentils with a little bit of veg, switch it round so you've got more veg and the lentils are just there to give you that bit of extra yeah. oomph in terms of protein and, and, and satis satisfying elements. But and, um, and you can increase the veg content gradually. It doesn't have to be like lots of veg straight away. You might just put a tiny bit of courgette in a, a big pot of dal initially. And then next time you might put a bit more. So it has to, it could be a gradual process, you know. You've got to do what works for you, you know. Make it achievable. I, I, roast, I roast vegetables and put it on dal so you don't have to have rice with it. Ah, that sounds gorgeous. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it does actually taste really nice. And um, Amanda, I know Amanda who's in the court in the sort of sector. She does a lot of growing of the lentils and the beans and things and sprouted, you know, is very, very good for your body. When you sprout the mud yeah. and things, um, it's actually good. But you can sprout anything, chickpeas, any of these lentils, you can sprout them. And yeah. it actually is good for your stomach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the good thing you've got bacteria. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, well, we can come back to a lot of these different topics over the next few weeks in terms of the, the gut microbiome and all of that. Um, and, and certainly sprouted um, bean sprouts are extremely healthy um, and um, can be used again. Like, I mean, the Chinese use a lot of bean sprouts and things to sort of pad out their vegetable dishes. Um, and we probably should all be doing that a lot more. So it's, it is about rediscovering the kitchen, I think. I think part of the other problem we've had in recent years is that we've all got so busy um, that we tend to do things for speed uh, and some of the healthier things um, are better, you know, cooked from scratch or, or um, done slowly. I mean, my, my slow cooker has come into its own again in recent times because uh, A, it's convenient to have the meal ready if you're busy all day, but um, you can you can get such wonderful flavors when you cook things slowly so it is about planning your meals day to day and thinking ahead um, and getting a bit creative perhaps with well maybe I can substitute x for y um, because that's a bit high in carbs but maybe this will work and just give it a go you know um, be experimental but there I there mean the, the internet's a a, a wonderful thing when used correctly and there is a huge amount uh youtube is just incredible now if you if you just search vegan uh low carb recipes on youtube you'll find no end of people who've got mm. little little videos there to show you all sorts of great ideas so i would encourage you all to think about it think about what way you're going to tackle it are you going to do a meal at a time or are you just going to decide that on saturday yeah, this is what you're going to do. Um, and um, we'll be very interested to hear next week how you've all got on. Yeah. C can I just add, um, so that you've got a positive mindset, try and focus on what you can eat and not what you can't. Mm. Um, yeah. That usually is, 
you know, very helpful. Otherwise, you just feel like, you know, I don't know. You feel miserable. You really will feel miserable. I, I can't eat this and I can't eat that. But think, oh, you know, I can eat this. Mm. What can I make? You know, yeah, get, um, in, get creative. Cre yeah. Be creative. That's that's what kept me going as well, was sort of all the things, because I'd done all the typical low fat sort of calorie controlled diets. And suddenly I could have my eggs. I make my scrambled eggs now with butter and cream. You know, they are to die for. But all those years of very pathetic little scrambled eggs with, with nothing nice added to them. And suddenly, mm. you know, OK, I wasn't allowed the cakes and biscuits and things that I, I used to live on. Um, but now I could have the, the most delicious scrambled eggs or an omelette full of cheese. Um, you know, you, you can really go to town with those healthy fats at, at making your dishes feel, taste so much better. Apart from the three of us, um, there are other people in the session who've actually adopted the low carb um, and done it quite successfully, like Rashmi, Ishad, Amanda. Amanda's oh. giving some tips in the actual yes. chat. So it's quite inspirational that they've actually done really well themselves. Yes. And they're continuing on this journey. Yeah. Yeah, and Amanda's got a really good suggestion there. And as I said earlier, if, if you can, if you've got the support of the people you live with or you live on your own, um, one of the best things to do is to clear your cupboards out mm. so that the tempting stuff is simply not there. Um, and she donated uh, hers to the food bank, which is a great idea because the food banks are desperate at the moment. Um, so it is important that you try to make life as easy for yourself. Dutch's idea of looking at all the lovely things that you can eat, not just dwelling on what you can't. Um, but also helping someone else by donating all the stuff that you're not going to have. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and, um, but think about the benefits. Think about why you're doing it. You've all come on this tonight, presumably because you're motivated either because of your health or because of your weight. Um, and I've lost in total now um, over three stone, three and a half stone since I really started to embrace this. I'm the lowest weight I've been for 30 years. Um, and I, I wish I'd got back all the money I spent on all the different swimming groups <laughs> over those 30 years um, because they just don't work. Um, adopting a real food, um, eating the way we really were meant to eat is the best way. Not only does it help with the weight, but you do feel so much better. Anything to add you two? Um, um, yeah, I, I could say that um, for me, I was like the, the, the thin on the outside, fat on the inside kind of person um, where I didn't have weight to lose. I thought I was healthy, thought everything was OK. And and like Carolyn said earlier, I went through like operations and various other things. My, you know, my health was rock bottom. So in a way, I wish I had had the outer warnings of weight and things you know where I might have started to look at addressing my weight so um just be aware that you know it's not weight that um signifies whether you're healthy or not um but I had lots of other uh, wins you know like I said before I was struggling to um focus to string a sentence together I'd forget some words um so all that brain fog what the, it's what they call brain fog lifted um aches and pains in joints and things when I just had energy I, you know it was just it's very difficult to kind of explain but as I got older um so like from 20 to 30 to 30 to 40 I noticed that I just felt older and in our, in our culture or in society in general, you just feel that as you get older, um, these, these things are expected and they're natural and we should, and we just accept them when it's not like that at all. Right, sorry, I am just trying to get that. I can see somebody's asking for tips on vegetarian meals. So just because it'll take a while to get these slides to you, I want to put in here that uh, link that I had, the keto vegetarian recipes there. There are some really good recipes on the internet. Oops. There are. What I was suggesting, Caroline, what I was suggesting, if you can put all these links and the recipes on our group, that way we can pick it up. On the WhatsApp. 
Yeah, on the WhatsApp okay, group. All right. Well, I've just that put one there easier. if anybody wants to pick it up now. And I also just spotted Amanda's story there. £150. Mm. That is fantastic. Yeah. Um, well um, done, first, so what I was saying earlier is you can reverse your diabetes. So well done. And I'm glad to have you on board. If you want to speak next week, let us know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, that's fantastic. So shall we continue next week now? I think so. I think we, you've done very well to hang on in there, everybody, for nearly two hours. So um, Before we go, Vishad's also said the same thing. He's, his markers have all dropped as well. Yeah. Yeah. All inspirational. Yeah. Our aim is for the meetings not to be quite so long in the future weeks, but obviously we're happy to talk if people want to carry on asking questions, but we'll aim to get the main messages across in an hour. Well, that's great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Sorry, Panna, you've you've gone on mute, I think. We can't hear you, Panna. Although it's not showing that you're muted, but you can't be heard. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. <laughs> I thank everyone for attending. I mean, we had 80 on our list, only 40 turned up, which is not bad, but we shall continue, persevere with this weight control and um, see what the results come up to, because I really seriously want to do something about my weight and I want to follow you. So um, according to your advice and to your recipes, and your links, I'm gonna go through them and learn them, teach myself, educate myself to it, and be slim like you, <laughs> like everyone else. Good. And healthy, and you want and to be healthy. 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 Yes. Yes. That's the important That's the important bit. Definitely the important thing, yeah. So I should reverse my diabetes. I should come off my injections, which I take for my um, dialysis instead of my dialysis. I should um, come off my metformin completely and uh, glyceride. I should come off my uh, all the other tablets which I'm on. 26 I take tablets. Oh my goodness. So I should well, go, actually. Go, yeah. Go steady and don't forget to let your GP know what you're doing. Yeah, I will certainly. Thank you very much, everyone. Caroline, Daksha, and uh, Davina, and um, obviously all the participants who have come in. And thank you for all your questions. I will put all these questions to Caroline and Davina, and they'll answer it and they'll put it on our WhatsApp group. So you'll get your answers there. Am I right? Um, well, we've mostly answered the questions in yeah. the chat. Okay, the ones you've not answered, yeah. you can put them in. Not answered, but I can just pop it in the WhatsApp. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much again. Thank I shall say good night. Stay safe. Night. Have a lovely weekend. And to uh, everybody. don't go out. <laughs> <laughs> Take care all. Apart from shopping. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thanks, bye.